What's up guys, Sagi here, and welcome to another Tech Gear Talk. Today I wanna to talk about the Canon R5, what I think Canon did wrong, what I think they should have done, and why I can't bring myself to buy one. I wanna start out by saying that Canon is getting crushed right now about both the R5 and the R6, but mostly the R5 because it's supposed to be their top of the line mirrorless camera. And honestly, it's all their fault. Because the R5 is actually a good camera with some really impressive capabilities, but they went about this whole campaign really poorly. And what I hope to do with this video is begin a discussion where I can learn more about how you guys perceive what's going on in the marketplace. Factually, but more importantly, in terms of how you think these features or problems would impact the way that you really use your cameras. I was on a podcast a couple weeks ago and it got a little heated talking about this pun intended, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to make this video, but I'm really interested in finding out what you guys think, so here I am. Now, a disclaimer first. I have a ton of Canon gear. Most of the videos on this channel were shot on Canon cameras. Anything from a couple of C100 Mark II cameras, I'm using a C200 right now to film this, and even my M6 Mark II. I also have a ton of Canon lenses ranging from the top of the line L series glass to almost every available EFM lens from Canon and some great budget options. So I don't wanna hear any nonsense about me being a Canon hater or any of that silliness. And at the same time, I also own a bunch of Sony gear and sometimes I shoot on Fuji, which I really enjoy. So basically, I don't care what camera you give me in terms of brand, I care about the user experience and the results. So what I'm about to say will set the stage for why I'm so frustrated with what Canon did with this latest release. Like I said, I value user experience. So the main reasons why I primarily use cinema cameras is the convenience factor. I got unlimited recording, super versatile power options, integrated XLR inputs, built-in ND filters, and fully articulating screens. So it's those types of features that really appeal to me more than things like increased bit depth or subchroma sampling. And it's not that I don't value those things, I just put them in perspective for what I do. So for example, I know that I can build a rig that will give me a lot of the functions that I talked about using an audio interface, an external recorder, and a battery coupler. But now I'm talking about more components, cables, things to charge, and I'd rather just have it all work right out of the box. And before we get back to the R5, let's look at how we got to where we are. I'm gonna build a case for why I think Canon did what it did. And the short answer is Sony. So here's what I think happened, and trust me, this will all make sense, so just stick with me. Canon was late to really buy into the mirrorless space, especially when we're talking about full frame. And my guess is that they either didn't think user adoption would happen at this rate, or they thought they had a large enough segment of the marketplace to the point where they could dictate the rate of the migration from DSLRs to mirrorless cameras. Now, on the other hand, we have Sony who came into this space and went all in on mirrorless. And not only that, they made a great choice to go with a single mount for their APS-C full frame and cinema cameras. For those of you who are not familiar with what this means, basically it means that you can use the same lenses on Sony APS-C full frame and cinema cameras. Now on the other hand, we have Canon that has the older EF and EFS lenses, which were designed for DSLRs, and they can be used on cinema cameras, but they require an adapter if you wanna use them on an EFM camera like the M50 or the M6 Mark II. But then they require a different adapter if you wanna use them on RF mount cameras like the EOS R and RP, and now the R5 and R6. So essentially, Sony only has to support one lens mount and keep developing lenses, where Canon currently has EF, EFS, EFM, and RF. Now, EF and EFS lenses have been around for years, so there's a ton of options at various price points and from third-party providers. EFM is fairly new, and while there are quite a few options available now, it wasn't until Sigma released their trio of 16, 30, and 56 millimeter f1.4 that this mount had enough fast primes. Now, Canon is releasing five more EFM lenses, but you could see the issue here. These lenses will never work on full-frame mirrorless Canon cameras. So the upgrade path for users is not as clean as it would be with Sony. Now, when Sony started releasing mirrorless cameras, they weren't perfect and they're not perfect now, but here's what Sony did right. They kept releasing newer and newer cameras at a faster rate than their competitors. And they got some criticism for this. And, and I get it. You don't want to buy a camera and then find out that there's a newer model being announced. But what they're able to do with this iterative approach is improve their cameras in terms of specs, autofocus, overheating, and user experience with each step. 
Canon, on the other hand, just kept doing what it's been doing wonderfully for years, which is great ergonomics, great color science, excellent autofocus, and fantastic lenses. And on a side note, when you hear me say a camera has a great color or that I like the color science, what I mean is the color right out of the camera or with very little work. So I know that I can pick up essentially any of my Canons, take a picture or shoot some footage. And as long as I'm shooting at the proper white balance, I'm gonna get really nice colors. So when people complain about Sony colors, it wasn't because you couldn't get good results with older Sony cameras. It was just that it required some more work. And I always mention that there is a very clear element of subjectivity here because each one of us has our own preferences in terms of what we want our finished product to look like. Now, if you're doing this professionally, you're gonna set a custom white balance every time and you're gonna shoot in raw, log, or HLG, apply correction LUTs and color correct and grade and post, but I recognize that the average user isn't going to do that. The average user is taking a camera to their kids' games, they're shooting videos of family events, vacations, or even starting a YouTube channel where they don't necessarily want to mess around with it too much in post. Okay, rant over and back to Sony and Canon. Sony kept releasing cameras that crushed Canon in terms of specs when it came to video. When you looked at resolution, frame rate, high ISO performance, Sony cameras were getting better faster than Canon. And this created a situation where on the one hand, you heard people talking about Canon color, user experience, how easy the cameras are to use, the autofocus was great, they have fully articulating full touchscreen, and basically the fact that it was simple to get great content from Canon cameras. Now on the other hand, you'd hear how amazing the higher resolution and frame rate options were on Sony, we got uncropped 4K or sometimes with a very slight crop with great autofocus, 1080p at 120 frames per second for slow motion with autofocus and audio, and then log options like S-Log 2, 3, and now HLG. Now these were features that Canon kept to protect their cinema camera line, which is a total mistake, and I'll get to that in another video. So to recap, we have Canon with easy to use cameras, no problems with overheating, reliable dual pixel autofocus, great color and ergonomics, but lower resolution, fewer frame rate options, lack of IBIS, and a substantial crop in 4K. Sony has much more impressive cameras if you look at just the specs, and the complaints were usually about the menu system, color, the lack of fully articulating screen, and the lack of touchscreen. And to be fair, older models from Sony also overheated and had autofocus hunting issues. Then Canon released the EOS R in October of 2018, and the camera immediately got crushed on YouTube. When I got my hand on it, I thought it was a really nice camera. It suffered from being a first generation, like any product. And it made sense to me that Canon had to do this to stop the bleeding and to begin a proper pivot into the full frame mirrorless space. Then the waiting game began. When will Canon release the next flagship full frame, which we now know is the R5? And this is where things started going wrong. In the original announcement, Canon said, the new full frame mirrorless camera currently under development will fully leverage the advantages of the EOS R system, helping to produce a camera that features high speed continuous shooting and 8K video recording. So when I look at this from a marketing standpoint, it sure sounds like the two most important things are fast burst shooting and then 8K video. What I think happened is Canon was just sick of losing the specs war. And so what they said was, fine, we'll just leapfrog where Sony is going and we'll get people's attention with this really impressive list of features. In the next release, Canon again started out by mentioning 8K raw internal at 30 frames per second, 8K internal 30 frames per second, 422 10-bit Canon Log H265, 422 10-bit HDR PQ, no crop in 8K with full sensor readout, 8 and 4K dual pixel autofocus, and again, Canon Log being available in 8 and 4K. They also talked about IBIS, available 4K frame rates, and dual card slots. So with five out of the eight bullets talking about 8K, and with essentially every single one of them, other than dual card slots being video-centric, it sure looks like they were promoting this camera as a video camera. Literally nowhere in this release were they talking about what a great camera this will be the stills. They didn't talk about the 45 megapixel sensor. There's no mention of 20 frames per second burst shooting with the electronic shutter or 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter. There's no mention of the improved autofocus and subject detection or the cloud integration. So as a consumer, I'm a little confused at this point. Like why did you make a video first camera with a 45 megapixel sensor? Now, I don't believe that that was actually their intent, 
but that's how they presented it. Now, maybe they were thinking that it will just be a given that this camera is a good stills camera and we can just stop all these people talking about how Sony has better specs. Now, notice that I haven't even mentioned once that these video features that Canon is promoting don't really work in real life situations. There's probably no way that you're watching this without already knowing about the overheating issues of the R5 and R6. Now, Gerald released a video and did a live show where he showed us exactly what happens even when you're trying to record externally. Not to mention that the overheating shutoff happens even when you're shooting stills and then trying to go to video. And that's that's just bananas. And it's not just overheating, it's also the recovery time that's gonna be a real issue. If you said you can record for like an hour, maybe a little bit longer, then sit for like five or 10 minutes and then record for another hour or an hour and a half. That wouldn't be ideal, but it would work for most people. But we're talking about it overheating waiting for 20 minutes only to gain a few minutes of recording time. Like, how's that ever gonna work? Now look, I don't even want 8K. There's zero chance that at this point, I'm gonna shoot an 8K. I don't need it and I'm not gonna use it. What I'm worried about is that Canon will think that this is the way to go forward. Marketing features that don't really represent a great value instead of focusing on what actually matters to most users. My experience with Canon has always been that it just worked. It was reliable, I knew I could count on it, it didn't overpromise. I knew exactly what I was getting, so if I was okay with the specs, I was good to go. Now they're selling this camera and saying that it could do all these things and it simply can't do them. Again, not in any real way. And I don't wanna have to switch to APS-C crop mode in order to overcome overheating issues. If you're going to market uncropped 4K as a feature, it's a difference between saying the camera can do something and it actually being able to do it in a way that many users would want it to. And if you've watched this channel before, you know how much real user experience means to me. So after waiting for this camera, looking at the price point, and then seeing how it was marketed, I just don't get it. And this doesn't even take into account the latest reports about these overheating issues being fake or intentionally placed by Canon. More on this later. Now back to user experience. I also haven't mentioned the real things that bother me about this camera. Things like unlimited recording. It's 2020 and I'm paying $3,900 for a full frame flagship camera that was marketed for its video features and it can't do something that an entry level APS-C camera like the A6100 could do, which is record unlimited 4K video to an SD card. Then you're gonna give me two memory card slots but require me to get a CF Express card to go with an SD card if I want backup for stills. But by the way, thank you for using UHS too. But then you're not gonna let me record video to both so I can have redundancy that way, even if both cards are fast enough for that recording mode. And at least I can record internally and externally to something like my Atomos Ninja 5. But I digress. So let's go back to the claims that overheating issues are fake, meaning that they aren't really based on the sensor overheating, but instead are software limitations place to help segment this camera. If you saw this report by EOS HD, it says that if you have 8K or 4K HQ toggled on in the video menu, for every minute that the camera is left on, even if it's in stills mode, the available runtime for these higher video options is decreased. And to make sure this is clear, it means that if you have this higher mode selected and you just have the camera on, the amount of time that you can record before the camera shuts off these higher quality video options decreases. This is all without shooting any video. After about 45 minutes of the camera just being in stills mode and taking a few pictures, they achieved complete lockout from the higher quality video modes. So can you really justify spending $3,900 on a camera that does this? I don't know. I know there are firmware updates coming, so we'll see what they do with that. And it would be easier to just say that it's a straight no if Canon didn't get a bunch of things right with this new release. They improved the autofocus algorithm for subject tracking and face eye detection. We also get autofocus in 120 frames per second, which I've been wanting for, well, I've always wanted it. I love the fact that we can now use USB-C to essentially keep the R5 running for as long as I could ever imagine using it. I like that I can shoot using Canon Log 10-bit and get much better starting point in terms of color correcting and grading than something like EO Standard. Of course, I like the headphone jack, the mic input, a fully articulating touchscreen, and IBIS for photography looks great. Decisions, decisions. And then to make this decision even harder, Sony's a7S III seems to solve a lot of the video issues that we saw with the R5, while at the same time it addresses user complaints with a newly designed menu system, 
and a fully articulating touchscreen. And it's at a similar price point. So if I want this type of form factor, the A7S III seems like it would be a better option for video, while the R5 will, of course, win this if it was strictly a photography battle. And I don't mean that just because of the 45 megapixel sensor. Like, while I'm happy to have the additional cropping option, 24 megapixel sensors have worked fine for me for what I do. And don't forget that a bad 45 megapixel picture is just a bigger bad picture. So I'm going to probably get the A7S III so I can do a full review and compare it to some of my current gear or maybe even replace my A7 III. And about the R5, I'm just really struggling with justifying this body for what I do. If I was primarily a photographer and wanted the best full frame mirrorless camera Canon has to offer, that would be what I would pick. But for video, I just don't know if it's the right choice. Okay, so now I really want to know what you guys think. Like, how do you feel about the overheating issues and some of the other things that I mentioned in this video? Do you feel like this camera would be a good camera and something that you might get? And you think Canon made a mistake with how they promoted the R5? And finally, should I change my mind and still get one? I know this was a different video than most of what I do, but sometimes I just want to share my thoughts with you and see where it goes. And if you like this video, please let me know by giving it a thumbs up, tweet it, share it, and if you haven't yet, join the community by hitting the subscribe and notification buttons. You can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Tech Gear Talk. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.